Hello, my fine friends. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Raha Lastapa this week with the wonderful and charming Lauren Patterson. Lots of interesting stuff about how lockdown affects comedians in this one. Um, lots of stuff going on. My radio show, Relativity, is back on Radio 4 at 11.30 every Friday. Um, please tune in. You can get it on BBC Sounds. Uh, there are links in my Twitter and on my website for how you can listen to the first two series illegally if you wish. I also have a brand new book coming out that I'm just putting the finishing touches to. It will be out on November the 5th. It's called The Problem With Men, uh, When's International Men's Day and Why It Matters. I think you'll like it. It uh, takes you a lot further than the tweets I usually do on March the 8th. Uh, but I think it's funny and I think it's got some good stuff to say. I would love it if you would pre-order it, preferably from one of the big places like Amazon or Waterstones. Um, but if you want to wait till it comes out, you'll be able to buy it at Go Faster Stripe and at your independent bookshops as well. But the more pre-sales we can get, the more chance it has of being a success. That is the disgusting nature of the publishing business. Uh, I hope you will pre-order that and uh, even if you don't, I hope you enjoy these podcasts, <laughs> you, you motherfuckers. So, um, Let's sit back, relax, and enjoy Raha Lasta Pat with Lauren Patterson. Hello, welcome to my lovely attic. Please welcome a man who has not prepared an introduction to himself because that's insane. He's already here. It's Richard Herring. Thank you. Hello. Hope you're all right, everyone. I'm shouting because I can't hear myself at all. I hope you can hear me. It's good I can't hear myself. That's correct. But we've just had some technical issues before we started, which was uh, very exciting. Nice to see you all in the chat room. Uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, we're... Uh, this is Richard Herring's Let's Start Teaching podcast because it's time to go back to school, everyone. It doesn't matter if the virus is still out there and going to kill our kids and teachers, more importantly, uh, as long as we try and get back to normality. So uh, I'm going to have to make that difficult decision uh, myself uh, quite soon as to whether my daughter is going to go back to school. I mean, I'd love to get rid of her, but not permanently, you know what I mean? So it's... Uh, it's a, it's a quandary, um, and, and also, I'm the most at-risk person in this house, So, <laughs> especially since the lockdown. Luckily, you can only see me from uh, the nipples upwards. I mean, and, you know, I, the, I'm, you can't have bare nipples on Twitch or you get taken off. Uh, that's a warning to our guest. Uh, uh, although I was uh, hanging around with the crew of HMS Vigilant, the nuclear submarine, uh, this week, and... Uh, they call it Rahalastapa, so I don't know if that's going to catch on. I genuinely have been t talking with someone from that submarine uh, on on uh, Twitter, and uh, he asked if I would send some signed emergency questions books because he says people in the Navy uh, love to ask uh, hypothetical questions. I'm just trying to get my glass. I always do this because I'm always trying to use this as a mirror. My glasses look uh, all skewy. Uh, it hasn't helped. They're worse. It's got worse. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and uh, he asked me to send some copies of my book. So I've sent them loads of copies of the of my book to the HMS Vigilant, which is good because it's a nuclear submarine. If there's a nuclear war, it will be one of the only things that survives probably. And so I've got this 50 copies of my book in that submarine. I reckon there's a chance it could become the greatest work of literature from our era, provided there's a nuclear war. So that's, fingers crossed, that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, you can buy all three of these emergency questions books at gofasterstripe.com. Uh, they're ten pounds each, but only twenty pounds if you buy all three. So, what? Who can say fairer than that? And all the money from that will go to making uh, more podcasts. You can also buy monthly badges. There, look, I'm like Eric Morgan. What's going on? And um, you can also uh, monthly badges. Go com slash badges if you want to support us on a monthly basis. You can also, if you're with Amazon Prime, you give five pounds a month for our Twitch stream if you want. There's a the video on our YouTube channel explaining how to do that. So. Please join in if you can. Uh, it's all about the kids this week. I've got no, I've got nothing uh, except uh, uh, my children to talk about. Uh, we were going on a long walk uh, the other day, and we saw the moon in the sky in the daytime. It's weird, isn't it? What was what's going on? It's like a confused owl out in the daytime, 
And uh, my son loves the moon. My daughter's quite obsessed with it. She was asking how far away it was. I had to look that up on Google. But I wondered if they would ever get to go and step on the moon. There's a possibility, isn't there, that our kids will get to go on the moon. But you would, my, I'm sure my parents must have thought the same as well. I'm sure my parents must have thought that 1969, I was two years old. They'd think, oh, Richard will walk on the moon. I mean, it's not at, beyond the question. I might hobble on the moon. Um, but uh, will our kids, look at, this, look at this, it's ridiculous. What's happened to it? And that, there we go. It's just, that's it. Uh, for people who listen to the audio podcast, this is going to make little to no <laughs> sense. Uh, but uh, I'm having trouble with my glasses. We've had trouble with our headphones. It's all fine. Uh, and uh, let's crack straight on. Thank you to everyone who's here. There's 259 people watching. Um, hopefully there'll be more as we crack on. Uh, this is an unheard of thing. I'm recording two Rahula Stoppers in the same night. It's never happened before. It will never happen again. Um, and uh, this one is going out quite a long way afterwards, the, se the second one. So if you're listening, it's going to be confusing. But uh, I've got a long, long night ahead of me. I'm awake at the moment, which is what I can say. It's 8 o'clock as I'm recording this. Uh, the next one's at 10 o'clock. And I, I don't really stay up that late usually, so that should be interesting. Anyway, my guest this week is probably best known for her uh, appearance on ITV2's The Great Christmas Rant. We know that's why we're here. Will you please welcome... Lauren Patterson, ladies and gentlemen, here she is. Look at that. Hello. Oh, hi. Yeah, very on brand, wearing a Newcastle I am, sweatshirt, yes. hoodie. Fantastic. How are you doing? I'm not too bad. I'm tired. You're looking amazing. You're looking, it doesn't look like you've been in lockdown for three months. No, and today I've been at work six in the morning until five. And look at this. Wow. Still, still smiling. Oh, that's, that's the beauty of that's youth. A that's a customer fantastic. service face right there. And you're you're in your bedroom at your you're staying with your mum and dad through lockdown. I am, yes. Uh, so you're in. It's not your own childhood bedroom, though. It's the no, bedroom. No. So your this used to be bedroom. my sister's bedroom, and then the right. second she moved out, I did what every youngest sibling do, which was be like, the box room can fuck off, and I'm finally having more space than I need. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it being? Was that a decision you made at the start of lockdown to go back to Newcastle, like a? So a salmon odd. returning to your spawning spawning ground. So my tenancy in London was meant to end at the end of meant to end at the end of March, and I thought because I had a really like expensive summer. I had three weddings. I had the Edinburgh Fringe, and so me and my now ex boyfriend were like, oh dear. "Tell you what, um, <laughs> there's so much to unwrap here." That, that was a, that was a loaded loaded ex there, wasn't it? <laughs> Just in case the people who are listening and not watching can't see the sadness in my eyes. <laughs> I'm fine. But um, <laughs> we had a really expensive summer. So we were like, oh, well, rather than add the stress of finding a new place to live, we'll both go home for a couple of months, save yeah. loads of money. We've got all these nice things over the summer. So we'll still see each other loads. And then I'll move back after the fringe. And then none of the weddings are happening anymore. So I suppose wow. that's a money saver. But also, yeah. I don't have a boyfriend anymore. And I'm living at home for the foreseeable. <laughs> My goodness, it's, been, it's been brutal. I mean, I think that's... As someone in a relationship, I was, I've was i thought this a lot. You know, if this lockdown had happened in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. I mean, it wouldn't have been much different in my normal life, to be honest. But also, it would have been so depressing to be yeah. uh, to be single through this. But you've, you've broken up during, during, have you said? Yeah. So literally today, this is what I might, I might keep like sneakily looking at my phone. My yeah. possessions are currently in a van on the way back from London. <laughs> Because oh, it's hard dear. to get your possessions back when nobody can drive other than Dominic Cummins. That's. <laughs> <laughs> but he went from he London. Be, he exactly. Brought him up, he? I'm like Cummins, man. What are you doing? You could have won yourself a voter by driving my cookbooks up. <laughs> oh dear. Well, that's that's. Uh, I mean, it's you were going to be doing the Edinburgh Fringe this year. Were you again? Were you had working on your show. I was going to be at the oh, Monkey man, this Barrel, is dreamy venue. But I'm like, you know what? All this stuff will still be there in a year, hopefully. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Keep smiling. Well, hopefully, hopefully your boyfriend will catch the virus and die. Though. <laughs> that might be that might be your ex boyfriend. That would then it would be a positive point, and at least one person from each marriage could also die, and then you don't have to go to the weddings. Yeah, no, that's not, that's not <laughs> nice. It's lucky I said that. That's not nice. Um, well, we'll talk about that a bit more. Do, I, did, I don't think I talked to you about ITV 2s The Great Christmas Rant, the uh -huh. last time I had one, which wasn't too long ago. Um, what was that? What was what was your uh, take on the Christmas? That was like my oh. first telly thing that I got right. to do. That was sort of like comedy. And it was, I think it was the Christmas after I got nominated for the award in Edinburgh. But obviously it films in like, what, 
September or something. Yeah. I got to celebrate Christmas in September, which was amazing. And it was like this sort of car park in East London that they'd done out like a little Christmas grotto with different rooms. And you basically had to write sort of like monologues ranting about different things about Christmas, whether it was like Christmas crackers or your family or whatever. But I mm-hmm. loved it because like I'd not done any telly before. So I was like, oh my God, I'm getting my makeup done. I've been given a selection box and there's fairy lights. Like I <laughs> fucking love TV. This is <laughs> Yeah, if only it was all as good as that. I know. You said the first time you've been on TV doing comedy. Uh-huh. Where did you been on TV before? I've, that's my interviewing. Do you know about my extras technique. work? No, I didn't know. Let's talk about it. I was an extra on Tracy Beaker. Okay. Yeah, when I was. Maybe I did know. When I was eighteen, um, right. they rang me up and they said I was going to play a mugger. So I was a walk-on part. So that's one above an extra. You get, yeah. You get paid more money, and I got a coat when it got cold. So that's why they. That's the. That's the ladder. <laughs> And um, when I turned up, I had, like, my joggers, because I used to do extras work for another show, which I'll get to, and um, I know you can sit for a long time around set not doing anything, so I turned up in joggers and, like, a hooded jacket, and when I turned up, they went, oh, amazing, you've come dressed, which I hadn't. I had not come dressed as a mugger, but what a great way to find out that my general aesthetic is um, criminal. <laughs> yeah, that is good. So what what was the other what's the other show? Yeah, that, it was a show called Wolf Blood, which was another CBBC. This is the thing when you're an adult who looks young, you get all the CBBC extras work because they're like, we yeah. can work you more hours than we can work a child, but you look like one, which is <laughs> <laughs> great. So that was I did the first series of that. It was like set in a school, and it was about this girl who turned into a wolf, but other people didn't know she was a wolf, and they couldn't find out she was a wolf. Um, and I played just one of the people in the school, but I was a like a what was it a I can't remember, a recurring extra or something, which meant, like, I'd be in the classroom and I'd be in the corridor and I'd be here and I'd be in the science room. So, like, that was fun. Yeah. That was just before I went to uni. You kind of, you knew, I mean, you started stand-up very young. You've been doing stand-up for eight, I think I saw you tweet that it had been your eighth birthday of stand-up. Yeah. So, in your 20, so you started doing stand-up when you were 18 or 18, yeah. Yeah. No, baby. So, So, you decided very early on to sort of, get into this I think that's the thing when you're young though is you're you've got confidence that you don't have as an adult we're not confident you've got arrogance because I wouldn't say I was a confident 18 year old but I was like yeah why wouldn't I do stand-up because I didn't know anything about sort of the world of comedy so I meant I had no fear like I wasn't scared yeah. to try it because I didn't wear sort of now as an adult I'd be like oh my god but there's gong shows and you get booed off and there's heckles and there's this but when I was 18 I was like this seems fun why wouldn't I try this like <laughs> I just went into it completely blind but also it meant I didn't have any one of my first gigs was a gong show like right. it, and I didn't even know what a gong show was I was like that sounds fun and they were like oh there's a big bell on the stage and if you're shit they ring it and you have to leave and I was like well I best not be shit then <laughs> seems the obvious solution here <laughs> well it's lucky not ever a lot of people go on and think they're going to be good and they are very much mistaken by that <laughs> um but it's a good way to find it's a good way to find out if you've if you're it's not necessarily you know i think it's a different skill isn't it to be funny with your friends and to be funny in front of an audience yeah. but for your first show to be a gong show is is a, is quite intense i know my very first one was then you know so you think you're funny the competition i oh, ended yeah. up the heats of that right because I didn't know any... I don't know if the stand had even opened then. I don't think the stand had opened in Newcastle. I know maybe it had... No, it just opened, so it hadn't been opened yeah, a lot, had. but I had no idea how to get in. There wasn't really any other sort of, like, gigs in Newcastle that I knew of, but I saw that competition was coming to Newcastle, and I was like, well, I guess that's my first gig. Like, And I didn't see it as, oh, I'm entering a competition. I saw it as, oh, I'm getting some stage time. And then I got yeah. through, and I found out when I was at a festival in Scotland I was at tea in the park and they rang us to say I'd got through but I kind of forgot I'd entered because I did it for stage time and not for a competition so I was right. like oh what do you mean I have to come to Edinburgh <laughs> like oh I hadn't hadn't quite planned for that one that was Susan Kalman hosted my semi-final if I remember she? rightly and wow. um the person who won I don't think has gone on to do much it was Ashling B I don't know if you've heard of her oh, no, I haven't heard no of her, she no. won that yeah but okay. kind of just fizzled out I guess <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a very strong lineup for straight away. Uh, she was a guest just the other week. Uh, She's amazing. Well. She was like my last live guest, in fact. Oh, really? I mean, not that she, they're all alive, but yeah. she was the last, what have one, you done last to her? one in front of an audience. <laughs> and since then, I've just murdered every guest. <laughs> and it's become a kind of murder mystery podcast because they're very popular as well. Yeah. Um, 
So, yeah, let's talk. I mean, I, I partly wanted to talk to you again. I mean, we have spoken fairly recently the last Fringe, mm -hmm. um, but there was, uh, there was an article in The Guardian about uh, you having to cope yeah. with suddenly all your work. I mean, you've, 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 you've built this up over seven, eight years and mm -hmm. got to this point where you're now, I think you just, have you given up all other forms of employment? Yes, I full -time went full-time full -time April 2017. So pretty <laughs> right, much exactly okay. three years to the day yeah. where I lost it. <laughs> we had a good so innings. You, so you were working full-time and you had a full diary and then suddenly, yeah. and I think I think this is something that people don't appreciate because they think, when they think stand-ups, they think, oh, Michael McIntyre, you know, yeah. Peter Kay, they'll probably have a bit of money squirreled away exactly. and, be, and get through this. But but a lot of stand ups absolutely uh, completely rely on live live yeah. work or largely. That's the thing. I think so many people like look at TV comics and sort of your big big touring comics. And then when they say like, oh, comedians have lost their work, they're like, oh well, wh why would I care? Look, they're obviously doing all right. And I'm like, if you think that's all there is to comedy, you are missing so much comedy. Sure. Like, there's a whole <laughs> circuit out there, which is yeah. wonderful. But yeah. It is, but then it's you know because I I kind of got behind this heckle the virus campaign for, uh, that uh, next up we're doing via just giving. Yeah, I'm actually doing I'm actually doing we're doing a a sort of closing gig for that charity oh, to try lovely. and raise a bit more money on Saturday. If people want to tune into that, there'll be details on Twitter about mm. that um, with some Adam Buxton and various other people taking part in this. So it should be good fun. But yeah, a lot that's what I think uh, I sort of felt like comedians who'd done pretty well yeah. out of the comedy circuit should. I, I really wanted comedians to kind of donate to that, which many of them did. Yeah. But it, it felt like, you know, I, I realised straight away, I mean, I think all stand-ups did, because <laughs> I lost all my live work, obviously, uh, that um, it was going to be very difficult to get through, even if it was two or three months uh, for us to, yes. to get through that. Yeah. Um, and then most comedians don't have savings. Most comedians Absolutely. are living hand to mouth. The whole reason I was moving home for three months was to save money, for the basically for the fringe and so I could yeah. rent somewhere a bit now because I was renting a shithole in London I had mice in the walls physically in the walls it was horrible the only reason my landlord did something is because I left a note pinned to the door that said I was having a breakdown and then they fixed it um <laughs> I was like, right, well, we want to move somewhere a bit nicer. Um, so technically, yes, now I am saving money, but I'm also not earning any money. Well, I am now because I've got a job, but still. So I think I had a few people saying to me, like, oh, well, it's all right for you. You're living at home. And I was like, yeah, but the plan wasn't to live at home forever. It was to live at home for three months. And I would like, when this pandemic is over, to be able to move out and stand on my own two feet. And I'm not going to be able to do that if I'm not earning during the pandemic so that's why I went and do you want to see my high-vis jacket I got it worked I do it. yeah yeah so what where, where, where are you working I'm in going... oh I'm giving away okay. to show my bottoms on there oh no okay <laughs> enjoy yourself I'm, I'm wearing joggers this, this proves how much I miss being on stage and being the center of attention because I got given this at work today and I was like oh my god this is the best day of my life I've got a high-vis jacket feels so important I have to wear it every time I go outside okay I think I, think I look great in it it's nice. It's very nice. Yeah. And will you get to keep that after the job's over, or do you have to give that back? I am not yeah. giving this back. Okay. <laughs> no you can way. Just lose it. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's. I mean, it, I mean, I suppose there's there's no real alternative to going back to work. But it's hmm. it, it, it's. I think that that would feel again. I think to a lot of people watching would think, well, yeah. that seems like a weird move to go back and work in the supermarket. But yeah. Did you do that? Did you have you done that kind of work before? That's the thing. I always worked up until the point where I went full time. I worked like bars. I worked in restaurants. I worked in shops. I've always worked to support me comedy. And I think I don't want to play the um the if I just take that working class chip off my shoulder for a second. But I think I've always had that mentality of like, but if I want to do this, I have to work for it. And when I went, when I first started to get paid gigs, even if it was a shit gig, I would calculate how many hours I would have had to work in the pub to earn that thing. Yeah. So if it was a yeah. 40 quid gig uh, and say if, if I was only making 20 after I travel, I'd be like, yeah, or would you rather work three hours in the pub? And I'd be like, no, I'd rather do the comedy. So I think I've always been very appreciative of doing comedy because I know that the alternative is long hours in a job I hate so I was like but yeah even the worst gig is better than the shortest shit shift I did at a pub or whatever and I always used to say like what the second I went full-time I think I don't think this is just a work class thing I think this is a general 
low self-confidence comedian thing I was like someone's gonna take this all away from me one day I just know it like this is such a fragile industry and it could all disappear one day so I'm never gonna be complacent I'm never gonna like get ahead of myself and if anything ever happens I will go and get a job like if my diary empties for whatever reason if I get sick or something and can't gig like I'll, I'll go back and get a job so I think that's why I was quite like the second I did lose all my work I was like right guess I'm going to get in a job that's fine yeah that's brilliant I well, like yeah, it. it has to be done, but it's you know it's sort. Of, uh, hopefully, it'll be a uh, short term thing. But there's no real way of. I mean, there isn't as I, when I got cancelled when I got my less square theatre gigs cancelled. Yeah, they sort of tentatively put them back in in June, and yeah. I went even in March. I went. Yeah, I can't really see they're going to be June, <laughs> uh, so they're now tentatively back in now. There's a few back in sort of the October November schedules, and I think even mm. that it's not. What it's going to be the thing. last thing back, isn't it? I had a few things rescheduled. Some of the first things that got cancelled for me, I had rescheduled to September. And I was very confident they'd go ahead. But in the last few weeks, I've been like, no, they won't. But you know what? Bloody love my new job. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it because by default, I am the funniest person there. <laughs> <laughs> and like the people that me ma's worked there for 15 years. So I think right. the, the, the staff kind of know about me through her. So it's not like being the new girl at work. Everyone's like, it's Jackie's daughter. And I'm like, I have arrived. Hello. And uh, I like chatting to people. So I think like I just sit in like my customers on the till. I'll chat to them. I do like um, I answer the phones to sort out like deliveries for the old people and the vulnerable who can't go shopping and they love to chat and I love old people so I have so many wonderful conversations and then I get loads of people being like e, you've been lovely to talk to and I'm like I think you're forgetting I'm lonely too like <laughs> I'm, I'm sat in an office with a bloody high vis jacket on like so I'm do you really get, enjoying it do you get first dibs on the stuff that is difficult to get like have you got lots of flour at home that's the thing that still that still isn't in many well, supermarkets I start at six in the morning at the minute so I'm quite tempted yeah. to like stockpile all the flour yeah. and then start I mean, a secondary can... flour business definitely yeah <laughs> you could make a lot Soleros is what I'm not I, I haven't been able to buy Soleros oh, for about yeah. um, two months and I, I I was having a Solero a day that was my treat <laughs> and so now my world's fallen apart so I'm having exactly. four or five treats a day to make up for the to lack balance of it out. <laughs> and that's the that's the result um so if you have any Soleros, put them aside for me. You know where to send them, and I'll and I'll come. I'll pop up and I'll drive up and get them. <laughs> I think that's I think that's allowed. It's a, it's a shopping trip. That's allowed. I'm still exactly. Allowed to the um, and uh, how far on were you with your Edinburgh show? How, do you have you well, written it? I took last year off. Um, yeah, and sort of went and did like a one-off of the show the year before which was called peachy and anyone who's physically watching look i got peaches on my bed because i'm um, very basic but very on brand um and i sort of came back from edinburgh and because i hadn't done the full run at the festival i was like oh i miss that i miss like writing a show and being in front of people um so i started writing material in like september october did a preview in February and managed to fill the hour. And then I did about four or five previews across February, March. And I was like, this is going to be like, and when you've got that fire in your belly as a comedian, yeah, because yeah. I'd had the year off, it reminded us why I love it. Cause I'd been able to have a step back from Edinburgh and all that chaos and be like, Oh no, I do like doing comedy. I do love doing shows and I do love the fringe. I just needed a little, little snooze from it. And I was really excited. So, but ironically, my show was about loneliness. Okay. Um, <laughs> And it was called Party of One, which is now a deliciously ironic title. Now I've been dumped, isn't it? That's a that's a one in hindsight. But I was really enjoying writing it, and I had that lovely feeling. Is I, I hope that all comics feel this because my biggest worry as a comedian is that I'll stop loving doing it, or that I'll feel like bitter about it. And like yeah. I never want to get like that because this job means yeah, so you don't want to get bitter. It's awful. So much, and that's why I'm pleased I had a year off because I was like, oh no, I do love it. I was just like. Yeah tired of Edinburgh for a bit and I felt so like excited I had all these like I just felt so I can't think of any other word other than excited I was proper buzzing that's it <laughs> And I was like, well, that sounds like that will still work, uh, yeah. you, know, sub, you know, after Edinburgh and for the next fringe, exactly. if there is a next fringe. I know. Um, and if it doesn't all fold up as well. Um, and, you know, I think that it's there must be a, there must have been a lot. Of, it's a real test of every relationship right? this, because either you're separated from the person you're you know, in a relationship exactly. with them, so many people are. Or you're not separated at all from well, them. This is the so thing, it's, yeah. It's a, big, it's a big test of love. I feel like I at think least I'm... being separate, we've ended on good terms. Whereas if we maybe say if we'd still been living together and it ended yeah. when we were living together, 
I don't think that would have ended well. No. That's true. <laughs> I think I would and have I think... refused to leave the flat. <laughs> <laughs> I think coming out of this single mm-hmm. will be good. I think it'll be good because I think yeah. there'll be, once it's absolutely all over, yeah. the whole of the world is going to turn into a massive party exactly. slash fuck fest. So it would be good to be a single, I think. And you I, know, you know what? A... Without sounding too, like, hippy-dippy or anything, or too, like, I... I, obviously, I'm aware what's going on is horrible, so I don't necessarily feel good about the world, but I feel really fucking good about myself because I've lost okay. everything. Like, every, I'm fine. I promise I'm fine. I can't stress enough. But I have lost everything, so I've had to spend this time focusing on me, focusing what, on what I want, focusing what I want to do next. And what I've realised I want is like, well, I suppose I realised it all along. I was like, I want to be up north. I love being up north. This is where I want to be. I don't want to be in London. I want to do comedy. I want to make people laugh. I'll do whatever it takes to get there. And you know what? I'm a brilliant person and it doesn't matter if I'm on my own because I'm I'm like appreciating my own company and stuff. I feel like I'm turning into this really like like Lauren 2.0. I'm, I don't know if it's because maybe the blonde is growing out or something. Like I've got blonde hair, but I haven't been to a hairdresser in months. And I feel like as the blonde grows out, like the true Lauren is coming back. And I'm like, yes. Yeah, she is. She's going to be fine. You've probably just got cabin fever and have gone mad. And once yeah. you come out of it, you'll realise what a bleak and terrible exactly. situation you're in. <laughs> but it's good that for the moment yeah. you're full of delusion. Feel delusion. I know, it, you know, I think you have to. You know, all you know, We've been so lucky in so many ways to have these a life where something like this hasn't happened before. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and where we haven't been seriously in a... You know, a world war or anything in our lifetimes. Exactly. That, that might that may change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, 2020, uh, nothing could surprise yes. me now. <laughs> well, it's you know, I I I think that things are are going to be difficult. Uh, yeah. I think for for a good time and and maybe more than difficult. So uh, it will uh, it will be interesting to see. But do you stay positive? Exactly. And, and it'll be safe in Newcastle. It'll be fine up there. Nothing bad's going to happen. Yeah, we can fight it off. I'll yeah. fight it off. It'll be fine. <laughs> right, look, I'll ask you some emergency questions. We did some for the uh, badges uh, beforehand, which were very funny. So uh, let's see what we come up with. Uh, these are as used by the uh, crew of HMS Invincible. <laughs> so if you don't like them, I can have a nuclear strike. Uh, I won't do a Christmas one. That seems in, uh, uh, inappropriate. Um, okay, this is uh, this is an interesting one. If you could travel back to medieval times... What single object would you take with you that would guarantee that you would be made queen slash worshipped as a god? Oh, I would take oh, no one of those micro pigs, like the teacup pigs. I would take a tiny little pig and just yeah. watch the like chaos unfold as this pig just grew to be like the size of the city. And they'd be like, who is this woman and this magic ever growing pig? And then I would okay. leave again and they wouldn't know what. <laughs> But then you would you'd be you'd be the you'd be the the, the god of the society. You could yeah, change everything there'd be a, for the better. There'd be a day named after me, and it would be a uh, pig day. And it would be the day a majestic, once blonde, now slightly stripy haired woman arrived <laughs> and brought bacon to the land. Very good. I think I am delusional, uh, Richard. I think this. I is... think you are, but that's good. I mean, I definitely am. You know, I mean, that's I I, I sort of all the things I I do that I've been doing in lockdown as well on here. Yeah. are all kind of. Kept, playing with the idea of mental illness and breakdowns i play myself <laughs> at snooker at night and i collect, collect stones in the morning but i've been doing it for so long now that i just think yeah well hey i was never quite sure whether it was i was really mad or not but uh-huh. then actually to make it your whole life you sort of it, you do get into that situation where it's difficult to work out whether you've crossed the line between yeah. i think do you think that's the thing with comedians i mean we're sort of we're sort of there's a pretense of, about who we are even if we're we're ourselves on stage it's still a heightened version of ourselves yeah but i think we play around a lot with the idea of madness and you know and misunderstanding things in a in a sort of insane way yeah you know? uh and I, I i wonder to what extent you start crazy or whether it drives you crazy i think it, it's i've always it's been nine, fascinated isn't it <laughs> it is but I've been fascinated by that, you know, by that distinction because co- so much comedy does seem to be about, you know, aping or mocking mental illness in a way, not mm-hmm. not like not like not knocking down it, just the the mental illness we all have in ourselves. Um, and uh, you know, so it's it's to something like this where you really are. I think again, if you're solo, you've got your family around you, which yeah. is, is nice. 
I think like for people, if people are just, it's sort of a bit like being in prison, isn't it? Oh, this, absolutely. This, it's like we've all been sent to prison. For, I did suggest in another podcast that we should all be allowed to commit a crime of the length of time we've been <gasps> locked down. If you could do that, which do you, do you have an idea? Do you have a crime, crime you would, would like commit? to commit? It's about three months, so it's not you can not much. You might get if it's a first offence, you might get away with punching someone. This is going to sound like the most pathetic crime ever, but I've always wanted to smash a window. Okay, yeah, that's <laughs> fine. That you you wouldn't get more than three months I've for never, that. So. Like I remember once being really angry at a flatmate for never washing these dishes, and I remember yeah. saying one day, like, if he doesn't wash them dishes, I'm just going to go smash one in the garden, and then he didn't, so I did, and I felt right. really bad, but he didn't notice because he never washed them, so he didn't notice one was missing. But like that, just thrill of smashing something, I was like, yeah. oh, this is a this is a new I thrill. You do. I reckon you should do that. Find out where your ex is living. Just go and throw a brick <laughs> through the window. Or turn up to the and supermarket you're... tomorrow and just smash everything. Yeah. I mean, you've <laughs> I've got a high-vis okay. jacket. It's fine. <laughs> it's approved. It's It'll be easy to find. It's her. It's her <laughs> in the high-vis jacket. You could put it on someone else and run away. Exactly. Um, good. Uh, is honesty the best policy? If not, what is the best policy? Tact is the best policy. Tact? Yeah. Wow. Because Very good. I think... Honesty is fine, but sometimes honesty can be delivered in a way that's very hurtful. So, yeah, like, you know, like, I feel like especially as, like, a woman, if I'm like, oh, I've had my hair cut and I think it looks shit, do you agree? And, like, you know that it looks shit, but what you want them to say is it doesn't look that bad or whatever, or to, like, soften the blow. But when someone's like, yeah, you look like a moose, it's like, well, no, you didn't have to say that, did you? Like, you could have been tactful. So I think tact yeah. is the best. I think I'm quite And tactful. with, and you're allowed to, is the, the tact allowed you to lie or do you still have to be honest with the tact? You have to be honest, but in a way that's not like soul destroyingly hurtful. Like, okay. that would be nice. <laughs> so, other things that I've got that I've, well, there is a question about laminators. I'm not going to find it, but you've been working. I've seen I you excited to work with a laminator. Yeah, because yeah. I'm in the office answering the phones yeah. some of the time. I sometimes get little odd jobs to do and I got asked to laminate things. Yeah, second best day of my life, followed by getting a high vis jacket. <laughs> I've got I've got a laminator over there. It's great. I don't use it very much, but it's oh, enjoyable when you do use it. I very yeah. much what, enjoyed what's, it. What's the best thing you've laminated? I was laminating pictures of fruit, which was okay. good. I enjoyed yeah. that. I think my favourite go- to watch was the banana because it was like it was sort of being stretched coming out. Yeah. Could you not just have laminated some fruit and put that? <laughs> yeah. that, that was it to put in the shop? So, yeah. This is banana. You, you don't really need to do that, do you? You don't need to put a picture of a banana, buy some bananas. <laughs> we are northern. We do need help sometimes. <laughs> Genuinely, I feel like such a stereotype. When I went on the checkouts, obviously, when you've got like loose vegetables, there's no barcode, so you search for it on the till. And what I have learned is I don't know what a lot of vegetables are, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> there are some complicated ones there, I have so, to say. Um, if you get served by me, everything's coming through as a carrot. <laughs> Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. And as long as the thing you're buying is more expensive than a carrot. Yeah. That's, the, that's what you have to that's do. That's your next podcast. Is it more expensive <laughs> than a carrot? <laughs> um, and uh, again, I noted from your Twitter that you're, uh, you were sad to realise your uh, 16 to 25 rail card is going to I've got it. Go defunct. Is it? Is it gone defunct? It's, what date is it? Oh, my God. Imagine if it's today. What date is it? Oh, it's tomorrow. It's the 4th of June. I expire. Oh. There I am. Look, this is me on my A level results night. Look at that wow, fringe. That doesn't... Sweepy, sweepy. But, yeah, um, that doesn't yeah. look like you. It expires, it expires tomorrow. Wow, so you've got one more chance to use it and you can't, you yeah. won't be able to use it. Where can I go? You're going to have to pay full price. Full They've price got 26 to 30 ones now. Have they? Oh, yeah, no, awesome. but I'm sad to, see, sad to see this one go. Served me, served me well. I could get twenty five percent off uh, any journey in the southeast. With oh. it, you get a net, you get a network rail card, and any any journey in the south of uh, southeast is is twenty twenty five percent off something like that. It's only thirty quid a year. It's That's fine. pretty good. Yeah, I don't use the train anymore. Now I drive into <laughs> London when I go into London. No it's one a waste uses of money. the train anymore. No one uses the train. Um, and uh, the, oh, this was another Twitter thing. I've uh-huh. just been looking. At, I've been stalking you on Twitter. Amazing. Um, you were you were giving examples of when everyone assumes that everyone in Newcastle knows each other, and yes, you, it's you're an, trying to argue against it. But it's annoyingly true. It really yeah. is. Yeah. So can you remember the examples you gave? I, there's one that I can't remember if I gave, but I'm also right. 
I can't remember. I, I, I did not say that one, but there was one where okay. <laughs> one where my ex said was like, "Oh, my family. Um, some of my family live in Newcastle," and I was like, "I bet you I know them." And he was like, "Oh no, Newcastle is not that small." And it turned out his cousin was taught by my dad's best friend. So I was like, yeah, so I do know him. And then it was when I worked at the restaurant in London, they were like, oh, a Geordie girl used to work here. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm the new one. But then that Geordie girl came back and everybody was like, but you know each other. And we were like, "Um, that's actually really a rude thing to say. Like how offensive that you just think all Northern people know each other. And then she turned up and I was like, I recognize you. And she was like, no, you don't. You're just saying it. It's the accent. Like, it's making you think of home. I was like, I recognize you. And I was like, what school did you go to? We didn't go to the same school. And then I was like, do you sing? And she was like, yeah, I'm a singer. And I was like, I've seen your band perform because my best friend dated the guitarist in your band. And she was like, no way. <laughs> but yeah. And then there was a third one, but I can't remember what the third one was. Do you think it's... um? I think it's a little bit to do with the fact that people in Newcastle get to know each other. Like in London, like you, yeah. that doesn't happen because uh-huh. you don't get to know anyone in London. Oh, the, Whereas uh, if you live somewhere a bit more friendly or a bit smaller, you you tend to, you know, socialise. Absolutely. And... I've remembered what the third one was. I wasn't oh, yeah. going to say it because I was like, I don't know if I can if I can talk about that one because of who it's about, but I tweeted it, so it's fine. But it was um somebody who I'd been flirting with since I've come back. Because I told you, strong, independent, Lord. Oh, you did a sassy little wiggle there. <laughs> that was a treat for the back watchers. In, it didn't take long. It didn't take long. <laughs> you Imagine missed the treat your... there. Oh, you are glad that ended. <laughs> But yeah, I started flirting with somebody Good. and, you know, right. like, obviously, I feel like in London, you're so used to being anonymous and like, you can sort of flirt with anybody, talk to anybody, date anybody and people, might, you can live like as many lives as you want and people won't know. And then I went into work and one of the girls who I work with was like, the person you've been flirting with is my brother's girlfriend's uh no, yeah, her brother's girlfriend's brother is the person who I'd been flirting with. And I was like, Newcastle is so small. I've been back a few weeks. I've flirted with one person and we've already got a connection. This is... Yeah. Yeah, it's very They're small. watching you and they know they know you've been flirting. You've been flirting very overtly then if you, if they've, if they've it's been spotted by other people. Not, not, well, it's gotta, just... You've got to play it cool. It's in Newcastle. Right. Everyone's at each other's windows just looking out for, like, intruders and new people. And we see everything. But I think it's because we are chatty. So, like, we'll talk to people. Like, that's what I found when I first moved to London. And I tried to chat to someone who was waiting for, like, the tube. And they looked like I was mad. And I was like, oh, it just doesn't feel as friendly. Whereas, like, I'll talk to people at the bus stop all the time and stuff up here. And I think that's how you end up, like, you'll see someone in the street and you're like, oh, that's Mary. And everyone's like, how do you know Mary? And I'm like, no, I picked up something she dropped once eight years ago. And now we're best friends. Like, that's <laughs> it's very much the vibe in Newcastle. Yeah. Yeah, but look, hey, I mean, like when I, whenever I got dumped, usually, uh-huh. usually. Like, the first thing I did was when I mean I didn't go out and flirt with people. I went out and tried to. You've been in a relationship. Uh-huh. You've got to get out and try and get snogging some people. I know you can't do that now. It's illegal, Richard. <laughs> well, you could do it with some kind of sheet. You could do it without snogging. Put <laughs> some kind of perspex sheet up with a little hole in it. Work around that. Oh, I never thought I'd be alive some in a time where guard. kissing is illegal. Yeah, that is bad. And also, is bad. this is uh, the first year I've been single in a while, and it's also the first year Love Island's been cancelled, and I'm like, Love Island just wasn't ready for this potato in a bikini. <laughs> Come stomping on in me Dark Martins being like, right, come on. <laughs> Who wants to talk about Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, which I don't think I talked to you about before, was you've done you've done a lot of uh, international gigs, I think. I, mean, yeah. I know that's a lot, a lot of stand-ups do these various circuits around the world but you've uh that must be a, a I went everywhere. Is it, is it, yeah it's a great thing in your 20s to get to travel the world absolutely with your work yeah because as well where have like, you been i went to so i came back from edinburgh in 2017 i went to india for two weeks which was amazing that's somewhere like i never thought i'd get to go that was my first long haul flight so i'd never right. been on a flight longer than two hours like the furthest right. i've ever been in the world was spain um so I didn't really understand how long a long haul flight is so I remember getting yeah. on the plane and did we have to change no I think it was a straight through um but I was like so how long's the flight then is it like you know four five hours and they were like oh Lauren <laughs> sit down so it was like what like 12 or 14 hours or something I'd never been on a plane that long I'd never been jet nice. lagged I was very confused but I loved it and the whole time I just thought this is mad because I I think people think starting comedy when you're young is good which it is it totally is yeah. but also like I feel like 
not to get the world's smallest violin out, but I feel like you get to miss a lot of stuff as well. So I, I didn't do all the like, oh, let's go traveling after uni because I went to Edinburgh to try and get better at comedy and to make the connections and, to, and I feel like I devoted everything to comedy so I didn't get to do the girls holidays and I didn't do the traveling but then I got to do all that like while I was still young but like for me job so the whole time I was just like all my stupid friends who saved to go traveling what they should have done is grafted very hard in a comedy <laughs> career and then being handed these opportunities but India was amazing and when you're playing India, are you playing to uh, local audiences or ex- Yeah, expats? they were largely local, apart from yeah. Bangalore. There was one Irish guy in, I think. So right. That was quite nice. And then after there, I went to Istanbul. But I was literally there for a night. That was weird. And then I did all the Australian ones. So I went Perth, Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne. Loved all that. And yeah. never thought I'd get to go to Australia. And then I went to New Zealand didn't even know what to expect there no only like no only think I've never actually pictured what that country is going to be like and all <laughs> I could think that is to do with New Zealand was Lord of the Rings but I've also not yeah. seen Lord of the Rings so I was like I have okay. no visual reference point that was very fun and where else yeah. have I been Montreal Canada I love yeah. that yeah did you do the Montreal festival I did, you did. The, yeah the, brilliant it was just for laughs so yeah and all that was in the space of about a year from like September to July and it was the best year of my life I absolutely, I got to see places I never thought I'd get to see. Like, yeah. I, I ate some kangaroo. That was yeah, fun. Yeah, I've eaten a bit of kangaroo. And yeah. like, oh, and I just, as well, like, I did a lot of, obviously you're with other comics, but you spend a lot of time on your own as well. And the actual flying and stuff I did on my own. And I thought, I couldn't imagine a few years ago, like little shy, introverted, awkward Lauren being like, mate, in a few years, you're going to get on a plane on your own. You're going to go to the other side of the world. You're going to have the best time of your life. Like, ah, oh, it was so good. So good. Oh. Yeah. Well, I wonder whether that, you know, it's everything we think, everything you're talking about, you kind of wonder, will we, when will we be able to do those things That's again? That's the thing. And I feel so lucky that I got to do it all, like, yeah. when I did. Because the best yeah. thing I did, I don't know if you've ever done it, is the road show in Melbourne. No, I didn't do that, no. So, like, that's them, run by the festival, but rather than just gig in Melbourne, you gig in all these little rural places but obviously because yeah, the country yeah. is so big which again I didn't know um they split it up so I did Victoria and you're in a car with the other comics and you go like a different place every night so you like you get in the car in the morning you drive to a new city you sort of go for dinner you have a little explore you do the gig and then you're in the car the next day but like as someone I always wanted to do you know the camp America like the summer camp stuff I always wanted yeah. to do that but again it's in the summer and I was doing Edinburgh and it felt like I was on like summer camp or something because <laughs> I had a lovely bunch of comedians I had Brennan Reese, I had um Georgie Carroll have you met her no. she's from Rochdale but lives in Adelaide she used to be a nurse okay. and when you go to her shows her audiences are like full of nurses she's amazing right. so I was with her um Bob Franklin yeah and yeah. this Australian guy who's really good called Ben Knight so I had a lovely group of comics and like we did like escape rooms together in the day and there was one place we went where it was this tiny little town with like you know like like a motel the gig venue and not much else but they had a bowling alley and they opened the bowling alley for us after the show for just us so we could go bowling and then they apparently they did it for last year's lot as well and you sign a bowling pin and that's like a new tradition that all the comedians who come sign this like bowling pin and that was the best because I think like sometimes at the international comedy festivals it, obviously they are really good fun but sometimes not everyone wants to hang out and stuff some people want to do their sure. own thing which is fine but because you're literally traveling in a car together you get I yeah. met a dog uh, I met two dogs okay oh that they were good days I met two dogs <laughs> but I got to do all these activities and yeah like, like bits of Australia if I'd just gone normal traveling to Australia I would have done the whole like east coast or like Melbourne Sydney whatever but I was going to these yeah. tiny little places I'd never heard of like it was so good, like seeing real Australia. But there was one day we were in the car and I saw my first dead kangaroo at the side of the road. And yeah. like, I love animals. And you probably gathered that from my Twitter feed. Um, and I got really upset. And then like 10 seconds later, I saw another one. And by the time I counted about 23 dead kangaroos, the girl who was driving was like, 
Lauren, you're really going to have to stop counting every dead kangaroo you see, or this is going to be a long fucking trip. And I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are a lot of dead kangaroos. And it wasn't one of those that you ate, though. You know, when you ate a kangaroo, you didn't jump out. I think out. that's why by the end of the trip, I was like, you know what? I've seen enough dead ones. I think I could eat one. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. absolutely. What did you think of the kangaroo? Do you, I, I like going to, I used to be vegetarian, but I, but then <laughs> I now will. I like to eat every possible animal I can. I felt so like, did you... I felt it's like guilt for eating it yeah. because I was like oh you're cute like that's why I don't eat lamb I'm like oh you're nice um but it was nice it was all right very chewy though like it felt like an exercise to eat it and I was like this is I'm tired during my meal it's not how it should be Ooh, crocodile did you, eat cro- did you eat crocodile I think my things have arrived I just heard a noise I'm getting my okay. possessions back oh really? <laughs> If you want to go down and get them, bring them up, we can go no, through No, that's the good thing about being back at home. I'm like, you do these things for me now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> are they glad to have you back, your mum and dad? Are they, I uh... so, but now I'm yeah. I think I've regressed a bit to being a child because I like to think I'm quite independent. Like, I learned a lot from, well, obviously you all learn a lot from moving out, but like, I couldn't do anything for myself before I moved out. So I think they've seen a big change in this. But because um, I work with my mum now, definitely regret regressed being like that scared little kid because a customer asked us a question I didn't know and I instantly panicked and I was like who do I ask who'll know the answer to this and I just went mom <laughs> like across the shore <laughs> Where's the stuffing? <laughs> they probably think you own the supermarket if you're working there, your mum's working there. That's like, for anyone who's like, I wonder which supermarket Lauren does work at, just next time you're in, listen, if you hear someone screaming for their mother, it's me. <laughs> I think you do, but when I still regress, when we go, I mean, that's what, I've written this uh, various sitcoms about my family, but I've, this show I write called Relativity is sort of all about, even as mm-hmm. in your 40s and 50s, when you go back home, you sort of fall back into the relationships. Yeah. So when your brother, when my brother and sister are there as well, we just completely go back to being Absolutely. them being teenagers and me being, you know, ten years old. And I think at the minute as well, because of everything that's happening, like you, I want to be looked after and I want to be comforted. So it's kind of nice yeah. to be back with my parents because they do that now. And because I've not been home in so long, like I think they naturally want to like mother is and comfort is and look after is sort of thing. So at a time when the world's so upside down, it's so nice to have somebody be like, do you want a cup of tea? Do you, want, do you want the kettle on? Do you want a biscuit? Should I have some cheese and crackers? And I'm like, I love this. This is nice. Temporary, though. I couldn't stay here forever. No way. Sure. And have you been doing any gigs online? Have you, have you tried that? They're yeah. weird, aren't they? They're very yeah. weird. Like, I like them. The best, I described it to someone the other day. It's like corn, you know, corn meat, like yeah. vegetarian stuff. Oh, yes, I was like, yeah. it serves a purpose, but it's not as good as the real thing. That's very much how I describe. So, like, that I find them enjoyable to a certain level, but I'm also like, but it is missing that real, you know, it's missing that real audience laughed out. It's missing just the thing of, like, feeling the lights on you and being on. Like, I've been doing gigs from here, and even if I've really enjoyed myself, I'm like, at the end of the day, I'm still sat on my bed. Like, I'm still in my room. But I'm doing one in a comedy club next weekend. Oh, yeah. But with no audience. Yeah, but yeah. I think I'll cry. I, j- I think I'll cry being because it's the stand as well, which means the world's me. And I think yeah, the second yeah. I step foot back in that place, I'll just be like, it's still here. Comedy never <laughs> left. Yeah, that is going to be weird. Yeah, I was offered one. For the, and I'm not sure because I haven't, I wasn't really doing stand up. I've done about three like uh-huh. charity gigs in the last 18 months. And I've, had, I've been doing this, yeah. and, uh, you know, like live versions of this and touring this. Um, and that I was offered like a fi- to do fifty minutes oh, yeah. of a headline gig, uh-huh. like sitting sitting here doing comedy. A, I don't know if I, I don't know if I could do fifty minutes, but like the idea, even if I, yeah. even if you're on top of your game, doing exactly. fifty minutes to nobody is. I turned one down for a really similar reason, yeah. and I felt awful. So like I've done a few, and I think my consensus is five to ten minutes is best. Yeah. Whereas yeah. like if you'd said that to me like. If you've got the choice of a, in a live comedy club of doing 10 minutes or 20 minutes, I'd be like 20 every time. I want more time to, to play and have fun and interact with people. But like the live gigs, I feel like five, 10 minutes works best just for like the context. And I got offered one by a venue I really liked, but it, like say it was 45 minutes. And I just thought it's a <laughs> TED talk, isn't it? That, that's it a is. TED talk. And I, and I like the yeah. venue too much to do a bad job for them. So I was like, oh. I'd rather turn it down and it go to somebody who thinks they can do a good job of that, then maybe like, oh, I want the money, I'll do it, and then do a do a bad job. I'm too much of a perfectionist. I'm like, I care about comedy too much to not do my best, and I know that I couldn't do my best in that situation. 
So yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I think it'd be very interesting actually, you know, getting back on a stage even without an audience. I mean, I think that will make more sense yeah. and will feel, you know, I think just feeling like you're in the place. Exactly. Whether they can do it, and I know some people are doing. You're getting audience response a little bit, and yeah. you get, you know, you, you're hearing them on Zoom or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I, I sort of hope that once it's all over, comedy clubs will keep filming shows and live streaming shows and and get yeah. extra revenue that way. The best I ones think that... I've seen are the ones who are like sort of pre-playing sets that were recorded in the club. If you know what yeah. I mean, so I think yeah, like, yeah. Hot Water has been doing that in the Comedy Store and. I think comedia as well have interspersed like sort of live things like this with pre-recorded and I'm like yeah that's really good because obviously you're still getting the live because there's laughter there from the night yeah yeah and I think I don't know about you but I've seen so many or a few people be like I wonder if all these people in lockdown know about that this is like for people who are housebound and stuff and I was like yeah, yeah well wouldn't it be nice to if there's one thing we can take from this it's how do we make the things that we've missed, like, oh, going to comedy and being able to watch comedy or theatre or gigs or whatever, how do we make sure people who this is their life forever, how can they get to experience that stuff as well? Or just people with kids or anything, yeah. you know, just like it's so, diff- it's so difficult to get out. So if you've got two young kids, going out for an evening exactly. is like a huge thing. You've got to get babysitters, you've got to do this, do that. And so all these things like the National Theatre putting on some shows like yeah. early on, you know, just some recorded shows. You're going to go, oh, we'll watch that. Because, you know, we watch TV. You can watch TV, but that's basically all you exactly. do as a parent. So to to have that opportunity, I don't know. I think there's a big audience out there, and it could actually – my worry is the clubs are going to go down, right? So I think the comedians yeah. should all be able to scrabble their way through, except the, the real drug casualty ones <laughs> who've never worked <laughs> doing anything else for 30 years. They're, they'll – They'll pass away through <laughs> hunger and exhaustion. But every, everyone will be able to scrabble through and find a way to make yeah. a living, I think. But if we come back and there are no clubs, yeah. then that's that's a that's a that's big, big scary. problem. Or, or if the little, you know, the, the clubs that are closed will be the little clubs. Yeah. And those are the clubs that, that, you know, like you know, you needed those clubs exactly. to get to the place you're at now. And then now you're working in the, the bigger clubs and touring the world. But totally. if you haven't had the little clubs there, you wouldn't have, you know, and nor would I. We yeah, have and this is what I've been saying to people as well. I'm like, there's so much talk about, like, after this, support your local pub or, like, shop local. And I agree with all those things, but I'm like, yeah, and also support your local comedy club and your local art centre and your local go go have a meal at an independent local restaurant, have a drink at a local pub, go to your local comedy club and just support, support the bit where you live, definitely. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to, and hopefully, uh, most things will survive. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get through it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it is uh, it's a concern, I have to say. But yeah, I think there's lots of positive things to come out of it, and I, you know, it's great mm-hmm. to it's great that you're being so positive about. It. I think a lot of there's a lot there's a there's two different types. I mean, there's more than two different types, of media, <laughs> but there are very much that kind of very positive. Yeah, you know, go for it whatever happens i'll keep pushing through and there's the, there's a you know there is a that more negative and more yeah. morose kind of comedian who i think will be really struggling through this because it's you're not getting the endorphins of performing yeah. and that's that's a drug if you're not in any other kind of drugs that's a drug i think, I think the reason um, i've been so positive is cuz it's made us realize how much i genuinely love and miss it but i think yeah. that can go one or two ways that can either make you really sad or it can put a bit of fire in your belly and be like well i'll do whatever it takes and i'll wait however long to be able and the moment i can do it again will be so special so i'm being i'm being i'm not normally this positive about anything other than dogs right. or and high vis jackets <laughs> It's a, it's a new lease of life for me. I'm quite enjoying it. Well, that's it. good. And the, I know I did, uh, I don't know if it ever went out, but I did, uh, we talked about it last time you were on, but I did yeah. that uh, show, that podcast with you uh, for BBC Sounds. I don't know what ever happened it's, 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 I don't know what happened. No. It, um, our advice wasn't good enough. We learned about um, mortgages, didn't we? We did. It was very exciting for yeah. me as well. Uh, <laughs> But uh, are, you, are you getting work like that? You do you do more podcasting stuff? Yeah, so we do one. Me and my friend Aaron, who works for uh, Dave and he's an ambassador for Calm, we were doing a mental health podcast. And then obviously, when lockdown hit, we decided to do some like sort of isolation episodes about like yeah. surviving in lockdown and keeping like sane in lockdown. And I think that really helped as well. Um, I've been enjoying doing those. What else have I done? I don't know. I work a lot. Very, <laughs> very happy. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Let me ask you a couple more emergency questions, and then I'll Lovely. let you get back to looking to see if your things are broken on the on the journey up. 
Yeah. Um, let me have a look. Uh, I could go. Let's let's go early. Let's go early on. Don't ask the early questions very much. Um, seeing you're single, I could ask you, uh, would you rather date... I've got to get the question. Would you rather date a man who is a six-foot-tall penis or oh, a man who, God. instead of having a penis, has a tiny man down there instead? Tiny man. Tiny yeah. man. You'd go for the tiny man? I'm only five Very foot quick. three. Yeah. So, like, I wouldn't want to walk around with a willy that's bigger than me. No. No, no way. Okay. That'd be intimidating. And, like, where about well, on the willy would my head be? Because I think if well, six foot... Well, five foot three. I mean, you'd just three. be down. You'd be below the helmet. Oh, I'd be, exactly. I'd be right in the middle of both bits. Like, <laughs> no, that's a world of yeah. smells, isn't it? No, yeah, no. I guess. But little tiny I mean, no man. offense to six foot tall penis men they, who don't all smell. Um, the tiny <laughs> man. So not all six foot penis men. <laughs> <laughs> and the tiny man is a sentient being in his own right as well. So yeah. you've got you're two for the price. If you don't like the person it's attached to, that's the danger. Though. What if you fall in love with, with either the penis or the man, but exactly. you don't like the, the other one? That's one of life's great, great that's problems. That's why it's better to just be in a, in a monogamous relationship <laughs> rather than attempt uh, a sort of Siamese... It's not quite a Siamese twin situation, but almost. Close um, enough. Uh, I think I asked you about ghosts last time you were on. Yes, I remember you that you, one. Had, you thought you had seen a ghost, yeah. Um, uh, let me ask you, uh, what do you think happens when we die? Like, what line? What do you think? Uh, I think, I don't believe, you... well, weirdly, because I said I've seen a ghost, but I also don't believe there's yeah. anything after. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a big yeah. old snooze. Yeah, just that's it. It's all over. I used to love, though, listening to... Um, we've got this radio station up here called Metro Radio. And like, I don't know if there's any Jodie people watching or listening, but you will know Alan Robson, who is like a local DJ radio presenter up here. And he presented a show called Night Owls. And he did a load of like ghost hunts as well. And I used to listen to the show like religiously when I was a kid. And he would do regressions. You know, you take people back okay, to yeah, like... Yeah. And I got obsessed with listening to that and wondering like, what my former life would have been or who I was in a previous life. But I don't think I, either I've not been anyone in a previous life or I was someone so fucking boring that I haven't recalled any of those memories. Well, you can't. I do, it's a sort of weird thing because why would you do it if you don't remember? If you, if you have no yeah. memory of it, what's the point of it, really? Exactly. Uh, even even if the memory is repressed in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, though I, there was a thing in the paper there, on the, in the paper, on the news website the other day about a guy who'd briefly... Uh, been in a coma, and when he woke up, he could speak fluent French, ah. uh, and he and he don't, but he'd done French for uh, at, at school or something. But it's been yeah. some while since he'd done it, and for a few minutes he could speak fluent French. But also, his family ah. from a few generations ago were from Normandy, so they were there was a theory oh, that, that was some like of that information somewhere. somehow it gets into your DNA, which might be true because it's kind of freaky the way kids learn to speak any language. They up, don't they? Yeah. But, you know, it, you'd think if there was something, if there was some kind of residual half memory within DNA, I don't think there is. Yeah. I've been trying to, learn, like... trying to learn Spanish during this and, you know, one of the like, language learning apps. Yeah. I've gone, well, because I complete a lesson and I'm like, I am fluent. And then I redo the lesson and I'm like, I retained none of this. Yeah, I find like, languages is my worst. I was good at school, but languages were my... Uh, well, I like Latin, but you, you didn't have to speak it. Yeah. Speaking languages <laughs> was... Uh, was my absolute worst thing, and I and I yeah I couldn't I couldn't face it. I've been getting um, really wound up because obviously I've got the accent, so like I can do that, I can read it, and I can like write it. But then you know sometimes it asks you to speak it, but I can't do I can't speak with any other accent other than this. So I'm like la quienta por favor, and it's like sorry <laughs> that was incorrect, and I'm like oh, wow, okay. what was written down? But apparently <laughs> Duolingo doesn't accept Geordie Spanish for you to pass their modules. Yeah, I think trying to learn. I think at, at the beginning of lockdown, people had a lot of hopes about the amazing things they could get done. Yeah. Um, and it was all that like fitness thing at the start. I don't yeah. think I think hardly anyone has kept up the fitness. Everyone's nearly up everyone's on put that, on maybe. a everyone's put on a stone. <laughs> it's going to be a big thing. There's going to be a lot of there's going to be lots of drinking. There's lots of screwing, lots of orgies, and lots of. Um, Whatever we were just talking about, now I've got yeah. distracted by all cheese stuff. <laughs> fitness, Richard. Uh, we were talking fitness, about that's it. Fitness, <laughs> which is is sort of orgy as well. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be the roaring twenties. We're gonna have a great time, Amazing. but it'll be it'll be twenty twenty two. I think before that happens. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
but you'll have a great time. I won't. I'll have the same time as I'm having <laughs> at the moment, which is a great time with my lovely wife who might be watching downstairs. Lovely disclaimer um, there. <laughs> <laughs> you might see it. Hey, look, um, it's been really lovely to see you again. I'm so glad yeah. you are saying so positive. It's terrific. And well done for uh, pushing on through in all these various ways. Uh, I'd ask you when we're going to see you again, but we don't know when we're going to see you on stage yeah, again. But more uh, likely to see us in the supermarket. I probably will. Scanning put everything sal- through with a carrot. <laughs> put some salaries back for us. Yeah, learn your vegetables before no. you learn another language. Learn, learn your, vegetables. your vegetables. Is there and, an app for uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with everything. I'm sure it's going to all be fine. Oh, and, thank uh, you. I'll let I'll let you get back to your possessions. But thank you very much uh, for you at home. Uh, if you come back at ten o'clock, I'll be talking to Bill Burr. So. Why not tune in for that? Uh, but thank you very much for the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, Lauren Patterson. Hey. Thank you very much. And we'll see you soon. Goodbye. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>